As always, I'm glad to be before you once more to deliver at least what I would consider a sermon. We have read recently, uh, at least a few times, Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. I would like to read those two verses this morning to develop a point that brought a question to me after referencing one of these verses. And I think, I hope it will aid us as Christians in defending the gospel. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It there says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. It has been pointed out often that this term here, dog, is used to point to someone who is what we would commonly call morally bankrupt. They're morally lacking. As such, this individual is engaged in habitual moral sin. Now, the question was, was raised to me, what is the difference in calling someone a dog, as in this verse, and using other terms that we might hear in today's vocabulary regarding our society? In other words, cuss words. Is there a difference? Now we certainly hear terms that we call cuss words, as well as many others used to attack out of anger, perhaps an attempt at humor, or even to show someone's surprise. We need not go very far into the world to hear these words that are typically, typically called cuss words, four-letter words, or foul language. There was a time, and I can remember some of it, though I haven't been on this earth very long, that people would warn you when they were about to speak foul language. They would say things like, pardon my French. But now they seem to want to speak in tongues in an unbridled manner. People who would call themselves gentlemen would not dare use these type of words in front of ladies. But nowadays, some men consider themselves women and vice versa. So what difference would it make in who or in front of whoever you want to use these words? But we see the degradation of our society. If not anything else, simply by the words we use. Can the Christian use these terms? What about if these terms appear on the sacred pages of the Bible? Is there a difference? Well, this morning we will set out to discuss these different ideas and ultimately answer the question... What is the difference between using profanity and using certain terms within Scripture? But well, before we do that, I think there is quite a bit of groundwork that we must go over in our study. First, we must consider biblical principles governing the Christian speech. As always, we want to define our terms. What is profanity? According to the Oxford Dictionary, profanity is blasphemous or obscene language, swear words, or religious words used in a way that shows a lack of respect for God or holy things. Uh, synonyms for this term profanity would be swear word, expletive, curse, or obscenity. Thus, profanity is the use of profane and or vain words. It contains also speech that would use the name or names of God to confirm something in a flippant manner. What does the Bible say about our speech? 
Well, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, But let your communication be yea, yea, or nay, nay. Whatsoever is more than these cometh evil. When we say yes, we ought to mean yes. And when we say no, we ought to mean no. This concept covers lying as well as profanity. We need to realize that words do in fact have meaning. And we should use them properly. It was pitched to me that words have meaning. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Jesus says, whatsoever is more than these cometh evil. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the, to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. This term corrupt here means literally or morally rotten and worthless. You see, the Christian should not be using rotten and worthless terms. This describes most of the profanity used in our society today and has for quite some time. We must refrain from speaking evil and guile. Psalm 34 verse 13. Psalm 105 verse 5 or excuse me 101 verse 5. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 18. This is especially true when others attack us specifically verbally. Matthew chapter 5 verses 11 and 12, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31, Colossians chapter 4 verse 6, and 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 10. We are given ample warnings about the tongue and the use of it, the improper use really. James chapter 3 verses 5 through, 5 through 10 reads, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter, or a great a matter, a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among, among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith we curse men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Again, that's James chapter five verses five or excuse me, James chapter three verses five through ten. We are further warned still in the book of James, chapter one, verse twenty six. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. One way to know whether or not someone is a legitimate follower of Christ is by their speech. What do they talk about? How do they express themselves? Do they use the same filthy wor words of the world? And if that is the case, can we truly say that we are followers of Christ? The Bible has things to say about our, atti our attitude regarding this topic. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, we're given the third of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Though we are not under the old law of Moses, the principle still stands true. Psalm 111, verse 9. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. There in verse 9 of Matthew chapter 6, he says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The term hallowed is holy or sanctified. Holy be thy name. Sanctified be thy name. You see, these verses point to the proper attitude that we must have toward God, our Creator. And the things of God must be carried throughout our lives. 
not only when we attempt to pray to him, we must always hold this attitude of reverence toward God. Regarding this topic, the late brother Ken Chumley had, this to, the, had the following to say. The reason why these types of words are condemned is because they express a mild oath, invoking of the holy to confirm the truth of what is being stated. Essentially, folks utter a mild oath when they intend to call upon something above their own honest statement, the implication being that the truthfulness of their character is not enough and something greater is needed. Now, I think it's rather obvious that there are certain words in the English language that are inherently sinful to use as, as a Christian. So we're not really going to touch on those very often. Now we must realize that our standard of words is the English language, in our case. Certain words are defined certain ways. And as such, if we are to follow biblical principles, we must not use them as Christians. This would apply in any other language. And I think it would be interesting to consider that there are no specific terms mentioned as profanity it's very similar to modest apparel we're given the principles that we should follow if we're going to be modestly clothed we will be clothed from neck to, to, to knee it doesn't say you must wear overalls all day but there are certain garments that would be useful in being modest before God and others and there are those garments that are not considered modest before others the same is true of certain words that we use. When you consider the definitions of certain words, they are inherently sinful for the Christian to use. I would consider those to be self-explanatory. Thus, we will not be going over them specifically this morning. However, our second point, there are certain words that can be used in multiple ways. You see, some words have more than one meaning. They often have at least one wholesome definition. However, sometimes they can take on a corrupt meaning. But what determines this usage? It must be the context in which these terms are found. This would include euphemisms, as well as words of exclamation. A euphemism is a mild or indirect word or expression that is substituted for one that's considered too harsh or too blunt when referring to something unpleasant or even embarrassing. And an exclamation is a sudden cry or remark, especially expressing surprise, anger, sadness, or even pain. We must note that not all euphemisms and all exclamations are sinful. When used correctly, they, com they convey the message that we want. A couple of examples. What do we typically say nowadays when someone has died? Well, we might say that they passed away. Uh, the book of 1 Kings is, makes use of the, the phrase, he slept with his fathers. That individual has died. There's nothing wrong with that. It's conveying the message that we are intending to convey, and there's nothing wrong with that message itself. Over this last weekend, many folks, I'm sure, have exchanged gifts. What do you think a typical response would be out of surprise and appreciation? Wow, or maybe even a thank you. After all, we should be a grateful people. Now, there are some examples of words that get misused. We would like to call your attention to them. We read James chapter 3, verse 6 earlier, and it used the word hell. As you read that verse, and even as I read it aloud, did we use foul language? Did you cuss? What about Mark chapter 16, verse 16? There it's written the use of the word damned. 
Same question. When you read that aloud, when you read it to yourself, are you cussing? Are you using foul language? What about Psalm 25, verse 2? O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Did we just take God's name in vain? Absolutely not. No to each of these questions. Now contrast that to how his name is used nowadays by most of those in society. What about the word love? <coughs> love is a good thing. We are commanded to love one another. Agape love is a very powerful force. Now, I don't listen to him as an artist, but I do know of the song. But Justin Bieber released a song a few years ago called Love Yourself. Now, that's a good thing to do. Now, if you're struggling with depression and, you know, similar forms of anxiety, that's one thing they tell you. Love yourself. You see, if I am supposed to love others, I must first learn how to love myself. However, if you learn the context of that song, that is not at all what he's trying to convey. It is a much more foul usage of that term. In fact, no Christian should ever be listening to that song. Certainly not we're playing that song. Now, also consider where we are. We're in Texas. And a lot of people have guns. What do we typically like to do with those guns? We thoroughly enjoy to shoot them. We shoot at something downrange to hone our skills. We want to aim for that bullseye. We ultimately want to hit that bullseye. So that would be a proper usage of that term. However, if I use that term as an exclamation, it takes on the meaning of another four-letter word that we might hear other people that we would consider heathens commonly use. And I would challenge you to look up that term and see how it's defined when used as an exclamation. What about the casual use of profanity? We would commonly refer to these as filler words. Or some might say, um, um, or pick any other word. Many in today's world would typically use different words of profanity. Typically, whenever someone is having difficulty expressing themselves, they use these base words. Often these people utter these terms without even realizing it. But by doing so, they're only showing their, only, their own ignorance. Harkening back to the verse we already read, Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, but let, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh evil. You see, it would be inappropriate to convey a message that we don't mean. And if these people are communicating or at least attempting to, and using words that they might not mean, they're going beyond what Jesus is saying here. More than these cometh evil. And certainly we can be guilty of this as well. In addition to showing their own ignorance, they're making use of idle words. Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. These are very two humbling verses. Points to the fact that I need to take great consideration, great care to the words that I use. For it is those idle words that might end up, well, that way they will end up condemning me. How do we use our words? In addition to showing their ignorance, these type of individuals are thus in violation of James chapter 5, verse 12. 
But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, nor by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Now finally, where we've been working towards this morning. What about oaths and curse words found in the Bible? We wish to point out that not all oath-taking is forbidden. Not all oath-taking is sinful. We see in Matthew chapter 26, verses 62 through 64, that Jesus testified under oath. Verse 62, And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So again, Jesus testified under oath. Paul, we find, asserted certain things, certain of his writings with an oath. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 23 Galatians chapter 1 verse 20 Philippians chapter 1 verse 8 and Romans chapter 1 verse 9 which reads For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers He called God as his witness That would be an oath Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13 we find that God swore by himself and we know from Isaiah chapter 65 verse 16 that the prophets of the Old Testament also swore by God so oath taking can be done in a correct manner which is the point we're trying to, to bring out here more often than not however many people improperly make oaths Next, we see that cursing can be properly applied as shown in Scripture. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. I think we, we typically read this and kind of gloss over the terms that he uses here. But Paul, but Paul pronounced divine judgment. Again, Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which has been preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. He even said it twice. Let him be cut off from God. It doesn't get much more blunt than that. But, Paul used it correctly. That was the idea that God has towards any who would attempt to preach another gospel that has been ordained. We see that Jesus employed similar tactics in his teaching. After all, he called many hypocrites. Matthew chapter 22, verse 18, and in several places throughout Matthew chapter 23. In verse 15 of Matthew 23, he even called some of them the children of hell. Potent language coming from our Savior. We know that those who will not obey the gospel are condemned. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Then there's another term that gets thrown around rather flippantly, and that is the word fool. We do know that this term fool can be used correctly in Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6. Psalm 14, verse 1. Psalm 53, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 18. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 21. Luke chapter 12, verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 and 36. As well as Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Where it says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? 
That was their state. They were behaving as fools because someone had bewitched them, attempted to take away the truth from them, and they allowed it to happen. Then we consider our term this morning, that is dog or even swine. There's a proper way to use these terms. Psalm 22, verse 16. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Our text, Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. And Revelation chapter 22, verses 14 and 15. It there says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. So this is the, the list of the obedient. They're in the city. Verse 15, For without, outside of the city, are dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and mutterers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Do you think Fido was out there with the sorcerers and whoremongers? It's not what's being conveyed here. Again, those who would do immorality, those who are morally bankrupt, those who would be committing all sort of immoral activity. These terms, however, can be used in an illegitimate sense. Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, or worthless one, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. These terms can be and must be properly applied to the given situation. And as such, they show the mind of God regarding that individual or that act. However, we sin when we use these terms incorrectly. We sin when we use them out of anger and vengeance. We also sin when we use these terms in a flippant manner or irreverent sense. It's a very simple analogy, but I think it does the trick. Mamas don't typically allow their children to wear nice clothes playing in mud holes. I remember my grandfather telling us that, you know, in the, in the clothes that many of us are wearing nowadays, that was referred to as Sunday go meeting clothes. Do you think mama would allow you to wear that to a mud hole, playing out in the dirt, playing outside in general? No, there's a specific use for that suit. There's a specific use for those nice clothes. Same thing for grandma. If there's any grandmas out there with a fine china set, do you think she would approve of little Tommy, whoever the little kid would be, eating some Fruit Loops or Corn Flakes out of that fine china? More than likely not. That china was meant for nice meals, for special occasions. Now, it probably wouldn't happen nowadays, but more so in the last few years, that grandma would probably take a switch to you for misusing her special china. You see, words are tools. Words, as has been said, are vehicles of thought. They represent our thoughts. What kind of words are we using to represent our thoughts? Are they impure thoughts or are they pure thoughts? Obviously, the Christian should be having pure thoughts. And accordingly, we should be using the correct words to represent them. Now, what is the cure for, for profanity? I'm not saying these are easy, but it will get the job done. First, do not speak at all. If you are unable to properly express yourself without uttering profanity, do not speak. It was coined a certain, another way. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23. Proverbs 29, verse 11. 
Secondly, if you must speak, speak less often. You see, the more you speak, the more you open your mouth, the more you attempt to use words, the more likely you are to say something that you don't mean or you should not be saying. The more likely you are to using profanity as, quote, a filler word. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. Third, consider how profanity makes you look to others. Using profanity makes you appear less intelligent. You might have the brain of Einstein. You might be extremely intelligent, but using profanity, especially as filler words, you look extremely unintelligent. Because obviously you don't have what seems to be an expanded vocabulary. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 28. Fourth, we must be concerned about the example that we set before others. Parents should know this very well. For after all, how do the children learn to speak? They learn from us. What words will be saying around them? Well, soon you'll hear them. Because that child is going to repeat the words that you use. The words that look, or the world looks to Christians as the examples of Christ. Are we that shining example? Titus chapter 2 verse 8. Fifth, stay away from people who would, or in situations that would promote your anger. Or eventually lead to temptation for you to lose control. Proverbs chapter 2 verse 24 and 25 as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. And six, the most obvious, follow the example of Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, he was given every opportunity to use foul language, use profanity. After all, think of who he is. Second person of Godhead. The one who actually brought everything into physical existence was sent here to his creation to fix everything that we messed up. If anyone ever had cause to use foul language, don't you think it'd be him? And what did he do? He didn't use it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 22 through 23. No guile was found in his mouth. Be like Jesus. He is our example. As we bring this lesson to a close, I would like to point out some more words of Christ, particularly from Mark chapter 4, verse 24, and Luke chapter 8, verse 18. Christ there says, Take heed what ye hear. And in Luke, he says, Take heed how ye hear. Through the principles we've discussed this morning, it could be easily said that we ought also to take heed what we say and how we say it. To quote the preachers of old, we must speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where the Bible is silent, call Bible things by Bible names, and do Bible things in Bible ways. Now oftentimes, we know the truth, but through lack of use, we cannot properly articulate our thoughts. So when this question comes, you say you can't use foul language, but the word that you claim to cling to uses it very regularly. What kind of answer are you going to have for that question? You see, there is a difference. We must properly use the words that God has shown us. Unfortunately, Sometimes we can resort to using these words of profanity as filler words. You're working on a roof and you hit your finger with a hammer. What kind of word do you utter at that point? These types of words have no real place in the Christian's vocabulary. Now, are you guilty of using this type of language or any other sin for that matter? This morning we have the opportunity for you to confess and repent, 
Repent and confess, and you'll be forgiven. First John chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. The blood of Christ will cleanse you of all your unrighteousness. However, if you are not a Christian, why not become one this morning? It's not an easy journey, but it certainly will be worth it if you're faithful to God. One thing you must give up if you are of the world is your foul language. I know that was one thing that I had to give up. I wasn't entrenched in it as many others might be, so it was a rather easy thing for me to give up, but it was still something I had to get over. Don't use this term in this situation. These are sinful words. If you are interested in becoming a Christian, you must have faith in Christ, John 8, 24. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17, verse 30. You must confess Christ before others, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. And finally, be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 22, verse 16. At this point, you are a Christian. And at that point, the work and the journey have only begun. And at that point, you must live faithfully unto death, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Now, if there is any need this morning for those who wish to become a Christian, or for those children of God who might have sin in their lives who would like to remove it, Whatever the need may be, please make it known as together we stand and sing.